Our prehistory is 100% listener funded, so please consider becoming a patron of the show. For $3 a month, you gain access to exclusive episodes, maps, and timelines. Your support allows our exploration of prehistory to continue. To become a patron, click on the link in the description of this episode, or go to patreon.com slash ourprehistory. Two men pulled paddles through ocean water. They sat at the back of a large raft, made of rows of bamboo poles lashed tightly together. Bobbing up and down on this boat were 14 other people, including children. Under the warm tropical sun, they wore little to no clothing over their dark skin. The passengers were on alert as nervous excitement surrounded the group. Behind them, the island they had left behind that morning was still visible. None of them had seen it from this distance, and none of them knew if they would ever see it again. Ahead, only water stretched to the horizon. But they knew there was land out there, a large island rich with forests, rivers, and large animals. They knew this from the stories told by explorers who had returned from that land. Before setting off, some on the raft with good eyesight had even seen this new world from atop Oceanside Cliffs as the sun was setting. The paddlers were sweating, and one reached for a bamboo container of water. Their voyage had been meticulously planned, their raft full of provisions, nets, bags, baskets of fish, nuts, fruit, and most importantly, five days worth of fresh water. They only expected to be on the open ocean for two days before reaching land, but they weren't really sure how long it would take since none of them had ever crossed this distance of ocean. The materials for the raft had been collected over the course of 30 days, and it had been constructed just in time for the arrival of favorable winds. For some of the families within this group, it had taken some convincing for them to join. Downcast expressions on some of the passengers' faces reflected the absence of close friends and relatives who had stayed behind. This trip was risky. For the next 48 hours, their raft was at the mercy of ocean currents and weather but the group was driven by the search for a new, more productive land. The paddlers at the back eventually tired and swapped out with others. The raft continued making progress through the night. Some slept, others grew stiff and sore from the bamboo, and others tried not to throw up from the motion of the waves. On the night of the next day, they made landfall. As they pulled the raft onto the sand, a dark forest awaited them beyond the wide beach. Some wondered how the spirits of this land would respond to their arrival. These people were the first Homo sapiens to permanently settle on Sahul, an ancient continent that combined the modern lands of Australia, New Guinea, and Tasmania. Their descendants and the descendants of other groups like theirs would come to be familiar with this mysterious land, and even today continue to live off its bounty. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 25, Arrival in Sahul. Members of our species, Homo sapiens, left Africa sometime around 70,000 to 60,000 years ago. In the Middle East, the descendants of these people interbred with Neanderthals and split 
into separate populations as they dispersed across Eurasia. The fastest direction of movement was eastward, across Asia, eventually reaching the wet forests of the southeast of this continent. From there, some groups of tropical hunter-gatherers turned south, traveling below the equator until they eventually left Asia and entered a new continent, known as Sahul. Sahul was a landmass that formed when sea levels dropped low enough for Australia, Tasmania, and New Guinea to be joined. Over the past 100,000 years, it was more common for New Guinea and Australia to be connected than to be separate, as they are today. At its largest, Sahul was the size of Europe. Over the course of the next three episodes, we're going to explore the life of the people who reached the end of this epic expansion of humankind. This will be much shorter than our exploration of the same time period in Europe, given the relative lack of information about the cultural developments in Pleistocene Sahul. Today, we will start with the arrival and initial spread of humans, and explore the landscapes and animals that covered Sahul at the time. The people who first set foot on Sahul came from a set of islands called Wallacea, which are today part of Indonesia. Sulawesi, Timor, and Flores are among the largest of these islands. Even during the last ice age, when sea levels were at their lowest, Wallacea remained separate from mainland Asia and Sahul. Based on reconstructions of prehistoric shorelines, the human dispersal to Sahul required a minimum of four ocean crossings, mostly between islands separated by around 30 kilometers. Of these, the longest seafaring voyage was the final one, during which humans braved between 80 and 200 kilometers of ocean, depending on their point of departure. Some prehistorians used to believe that the colonization of Sahul was an accident, the result of a group of fishermen and women being carried out to sea by an ocean current or storm. However, it's now thought that a raft drifting on ocean currents would have taken at least four days to reach Sahul from the nearest Wallacean Islands, making the survival of an unprepared group unlikely. So today, most prehistorians believe that the migration of humans to Sahul was planned by capable ocean travelers. If they paddled bamboo rafts or canoes, it would have taken two to three days to make landfall, a serious undertaking requiring provisions of food and water. Furthermore, the idea that this sea voyage was a common occurrence is supported by the genetics of Aboriginal Australians and Papuans from New Guinea, who are direct descendants of the first people to arrive in Sahul. From the level of genetic diversity found in these modern populations, it's estimated that between 1,000 and 2,000 people arrived in Sahul within a period of about a thousand years. This implies that dozens of separate groups made this multi-day trip across the ocean. This migratory success is especially remarkable considering that the waters surrounding the Wallacean Islands are challenging to maneuver in unmotorized boats. Strong oceanic currents here move water between the Pacific and Indian Oceans through deep trenches. Knowledge of these currents and seasonal changes in wind direction would have been valuable to the migrants. They probably didn't set off from Wallacea without having seen the land they were going to. By climbing up to elevated lookout points on certain islands with ideal weather conditions, they would have been able to make out Sahul on the horizon. Other signs, like smoke from wildfires and flight paths of birds, might have confirmed the presence of land in the distance. Given the number of people that successfully made this challenging voyage, it's likely that the people inhabiting Wallacea 
had developed a close relationship to the ocean, and there is some archaeological evidence to support this idea. The oldest signs of human life in this region come from the island of Timor and date back 44,000 years. The remains of ancient camps within caves here show a high dependence on marine resources for survival, including shellfish, sea urchins, crabs, marine turtles, and fish. An analysis of carbon isotopes in a human tooth reveals that seafood was the primary component of at least this person's diet. This is the oldest evidence for a marine-focused economy anywhere in the world. The drive to depend so heavily on seafood for sustenance was due to the faunal poverty of Wallacea, where the first humans often resorted to hunting small animals like rats, bats, and small lizards. These islands had much fewer large animals to hunt than mainland Asia from where they had arrived. Many of the fish found in these caves live in coral reefs surrounding these islands, but some may have been caught further offshore. We don't know what type of technology was used in fishing. Reef fish could have been caught with nets, traps, barbed spears, or hooks and lines. Regardless, Wallaceans were developing specialized tools which provided them access to marine resources. If they constructed boats for fishing, it would explain how they first acquired skills in seafaring. The adaptation to island life prepared these fisher-hunter-gatherers for the trip from Wallacea to Sahul. They had gathered enough confidence to undertake a riskier ocean voyage than any other between Wallacean islands. Failure meant being swept away in a current, the inability to make landfall, and death by dehydration. And yet, they left behind the islands they knew well and had been fishing for years to explore a new land they knew little about. Once a few hundred people had made the landfall in Sahul, a stable population of our species would have been established, and exploration along the coast and into the hinterland undertaken. But where did this first Sahulian population live? And when did they first arrive? Both of these questions have been the subject of much debate. When it comes to where they first arrived, a few Wallacean islands were close enough to Sahul to have been realistic departure points. One of these is Timor, from which people could have paddled 135 kilometers to reach small islands near the coast of northwest Australia. This is referred to as the Southern Route. Another potential point of departure is the Maluku Islands further north, from which people only had to cross 80 kilometers of ocean to reach the western coast of New Guinea. This is referred to as the northern route, and given the shorter distance, is considered the easiest location to make an ocean crossing to Sahul. Both voyages were plausible for groups in rafts to successfully undertake in two to three days. Over the past few years, genetic studies of Papuans and Aboriginal Australians have raised the possibility of two separate migrations from Wallacea to Sahul, one along the northern route and another along the southern route. This theory comes from the observation that Papuan genetic lineages have been diverging from those of Aboriginal Australians for an estimated 50,000 years, which is old enough to have taken place just before the migration to Sahul, instead of after the migrants made landfall. In other words, the ancestors of these two groups may have belonged to separate populations in Wallacea that departed in isolated migrations from the Maluku Islands and Timor. This level of analysis is made possible by the remarkable genetic continuity of people living in Australia and New Guinea before the arrival of Europeans. 
After the initial dispersal from Wallacea, there appears to have been little mixing with outside groups. Despite the deep split between these groups, Papuans living in New Guinea today are more closely related to Aboriginal Australians than to any other global population. This means that once colonized, the people of Sahul remained essentially isolated from the world population for tens of thousands of years. As for the question of when humans first arrived in Sahul, the answer is also unclear. Unlike Eurasia, where Neanderthals and Denisovans also lived, our species is believed to be the only hominin to ever reach Sahul. Therefore, any stone tools found here are considered evidence for the presence of Homo sapiens, and the age of the oldest tools would represent the minimum date that people landed from Wallacea. But this process is complicated by the limitations of our dating technology. The radiocarbon method can determine the age of organic material, like charcoal from ancient campfires, found alongside stone tools. However, this technique is only effective up to 50,000 years ago. Unfortunately, the oldest radiocarbon dates of archaeological sites in Australia and New Guinea fall between 50,000 and 45,000 years ago, meaning that this evidence of human activity may actually be more than 50,000 years old. Other dating techniques have been applied to attempt to resolve this issue, including some that are able to date inorganic minerals, such as grains of sand and dust. These methods can determine the last time that a grain of sand was exposed to sunlight, revealing when a layer of sediment was buried under other deposits, and presumably also when the artifacts contained within the sediments were buried. Using these techniques, some of the oldest Australian archaeological sites have been dated. Most seem to match the radiocarbon dates, falling between 50,000 and 45,000 years ago. However, one site in northwest Australia produced an age of 65,000 years ago. Called Majebebe, the oldest layer of this ancient camp contains stone tools, stone axes, points, ochre, and grinding stones. Since the publication of this date in 2017, experts of Australian archaeology have been divided on its accuracy, with some believing it to be an error, the result of natural mixing of younger stone tools with older sand. They point out that some of the artifacts like grinding stones and points, are not typical of the earliest colonists of Sahul. Depending on the validity of the Majebebe date, two scenarios for human migration to Sahul are proposed, an earlier arrival around 65,000 years ago, or a late arrival around 50,000 years ago. A large difference. The correct date has large implications for global prehistory, especially for the out-of-Africa dispersal of our species. If humans landed in Sahul by 65,000 years ago, it supports theories of an early dispersal across southern Asia, and of multiple waves of Homo sapiens arriving in East Asia. On the other hand, arrival in Sahul around 50,000 years ago is more in line with a single late migration across Eurasia, the scenario that is supported by the current genetic evidence. Until the Majebebe date is disproven, or other old sites like it are found, this uncertainty will remain. No matter how long ago humans paddled their rafts from Wallacea to Sahul, Homo sapiens was the only hominin species to successfully make that voyage. Others had made it to Southeast Asia, and even to the islands of Wallacea, including Homo erectus, Denisovans, and the small-bodied, island-dwelling species Homo floresiensis and Homo luzonensis. Yet, 
despite living in the region for hundreds of thousands of years, and probably capable of making short oceanic trips. Our evolutionary cousins never made the final crossing to Sahul. On the other hand, our species settled Sahul soon after arriving in Wallacea, and probably contributed to the disappearance of those other tool-making hominids. The arrival of humans in Sahul marked a unique event in prehistory, which would only be replicated in America. This was the dispersal of our species into a continent untouched by any other hominin. The flora and fauna of these lands had evolved in the absence of intelligent, tool-wielding hominins. Human colonization of this virgin continent proceeded in the absence of competition from similar species, within ecosystems of plant and animals unlike those of any other continent. The first migrants to arrive in Sahul were specialists at exploiting marine resources, but it did not take long for their descendants to move inland and adapt to a greater dependence on terrestrial food. Whether they landed on the west coast of New Guinea or northern Australia, they would have found tropical forests and savannas. At the time, a large plain connected New Guinea to Australia covered by open grasslands and woodlands of acacia and eucalyptus trees. Some tropical plants would have been familiar to the people who had lived in Wallacea, but the animals they encountered and learned how to hunt would have been strikingly different from those on the islands. We will talk more about the fascinating Sahulian fauna in more depth later. As the human population grew on the tropical northwestern coast, bands of hunter-gatherers began exploring more of the continent. By 45,000 years ago, descendants of the Wallacean seafarers had dispersed over several thousand kilometers in multiple directions, reaching the southern and eastern margins of the continent. Based on the currently known archaeological sites, of which only about 13 are older than 45,000 years, we can't map the specific routes of dispersal taken by these Sahulian pioneers. All we can say is that if people arrived around 50,000 years ago, they had settled in most regions of the continent within 5,000 years of landing. More information about the earliest movements of people across Sahul have been reconstructed from the DNA of Aboriginal Australians and Papuans, among whom ancient lineages exist that diverged from each other almost 50,000 years ago. What these patterns show is an extremely ancient separation between Aboriginal Australians living today in the east from those in the west, on either side of the harsh central deserts. From this, we can infer at least three major branches of early dispersal across Sahul. One group that moved east after arriving, the ancestors of the Papuans who settled in the equatorial forests and savannas of New Guinea. The two other branches went southeast and southwest into the drier woodlands, grasslands, and deserts of Australia. The branch of people that moved eastward traveled more than 1,000 kilometers to reach the far coast of New Guinea by 45,000 years ago. Here, they found rainforests and the tallest mountain range in Sahul. The earliest settlers even climbed these mountains and made camps in remote valleys within the highlands, 2,000 meters above sea level. The people that went south quickly learned to survive in more arid landscapes, by moving along watercourses. Several of their camps have been discovered hundreds of kilometers inland. One route of dispersal was down the west coast of Australia, along the edge of deserts, until they reached temperate forests in the southwest corner of the continent, where 45,000-year-old stone tools have been discovered in a cave. 
a separate branch of hunter-gatherer groups moved southward along the eastern margin of the Australian deserts, and eventually reached lake and river networks in the southeast of Australia, where three camps older than 45,000 years have been excavated. Among the oldest archaeological sites in Australia, 84% are found within 20 kilometers of permanent sources of water. Younger archaeological sites, on the other hand, are more likely to be found further from those sources, suggesting that the first settlers into the arid zone were less comfortable venturing far from rivers, lakes, and springs. Also, based on the location of archaeological sites, some prehistorians argue that Sahulian pioneers chose to live near highly visible landmarks, like mountains and rock formations, to navigate easily through their new homeland. So, by 45,000 years ago, the human population extended across a large proportion of Sahul's landmass, but a few remote areas remained unoccupied and would be settled over the next 5,000 years. The first of these was another marine migration from the coast of New Guinea to the Bismarck Archipelago, Reaching the nearest large island required two ocean crossings of 50 and 30 kilometers. Around 44,000 years ago, human habitation had begun and would continue for tens of thousands of years. Much like the Wallacean Islands, the tropical Bismarck Archipelago did not have large terrestrial animals, and people depended heavily on shellfish and marine fishing for sustenance. Another important dispersal was into the southernmost peninsula of Sahul, which today is known as the island of Tasmania. The land bridge from Australia was underwater until 42,000 years ago, and the earliest known archaeological sites here date to about 40,000 years ago. In Tasmania, temperatures were colder than anywhere else in Sahul. At 42 degrees south latitude, a similar distance from the equator as northern Spain, temperate forests and grasslands covered mountainous terrain that experienced winter temperatures around the freezing point, a far cry from the equatorial forests of northern Sahul. Lastly, the final frontier of human exploration in Sahul were the central deserts of the continent, where evidence of human presence only appears around 35,000 years ago. The chronology for the arrival and expansion of Homo sapiens in Sahul stands in stark contrast to European prehistory. Our species occupied Sahul sooner than Europe, even though Europe was much closer to the exit point from Africa. In Europe, it took until the extinction of Neanderthals, around 40,000 years ago, for Homo sapiens to spread widely, and until 35,000 years ago, to reach more remote areas. On the other hand, our species had already dispersed widely in Sahul around 45,000 years ago, five millennia before the Neanderthal extinction. Apparently, it was easier for bands of Homo sapiens to disperse eastward across southern Asia than it was to expand north into Europe. This is not surprising given that our ancestors evolved in a warm climate. The degree to which other hominin species affected the movement eastward through Asia is unknown, but once in Sahul, this was no longer a problem. In this land, untouched by Neanderthals or Denisovans, the human population thrived and expanded quickly. About 35 million years ago, Sahul separated from Antarctica isolating it from other land masses. This separation led to the evolution of animals unlike those of any other continent. Sahulian fauna included reptiles and birds, but was composed primarily of marsupials, instead of placental mammals like other continents. The only placental mammals were rodents and bats that had arrived from Wallacea. 
So the first humans to land on the northwest coast of Sahul were likely perplexed by the strange creatures they found. Hopping across open grasslands were kangaroos and their smaller cousins, wallaroos and wallabies. With long hind legs, short front limbs, and powerful tails, kangaroos and wallabies were among the larger herbivores on the continent and became key sources of meat for human hunters. Smaller cousins of the kangaroo had evolved to other ecosystems, like the patamelons in the closed forests of Tasmania and New Guinea, and rock wallabies with specialized feet to climb in rocky terrain. An incredible diversity of small marsupials populated Sahul, including the rabbit-like bilbies and bandicoots, and many arboreal marsupials in the forests of northern Sahul, including a range of possums and tree kangaroos. Also, the first explorers of Sahul would have found the bizarre egg-laying mammals, the echidnas, covered in sharp quills, and the platypus, with its webbed feet, duckbill, and beaver tail. Other marsupials had evolved to prey on herbivores, and some of these carnivores ranged across most of the continent. The first human explorers would have encountered the striped, wolf-sized thylacine, and heard the disturbing nocturnal screeches of the Tasmanian devil, which once lived across Australia. The largest terrestrial carnivore is sometimes called the marsupial lion, only around the size of the American jaguar, this fearsome creature had evolved powerful forelimbs and was capable of wrestling large herbivores to the ground. Unlike feline predators, the marsupial lion did not have large canine teeth, but instead massive incisors and bizarre blade-like molar teeth designed to slice through flesh. An aggressive carnivore, which people would have already learned to avoid in Wallacea, was the large saltwater crocodile, which inhabited the estuaries, mangroves, and rivers of Sahul. Another frightening Sahulian reptile was a giant relative of the Komodo dragon. Armed with serrated teeth and a venomous bite, and stretching five meters from head to tail, it was the largest terrestrial lizard to ever live. Finally, in this new world, people would have also discovered several species of large, flightless birds, including the emu in Australia and the cassowary in New Guinea. Much like the rest of the world, several animals living in Sahul 50,000 years ago are considered megafauna, which in the broadest sense includes all species that weigh more than 40 kilograms. Yet, of all the continents, Sahul had the smallest megafauna, lacking elephant and mammoth-sized creatures. Most Sahulian megafauna were marsupials, including 12 species of extinct kangaroos, the largest of which was the giant short-faced kangaroo. Weighing 240 kilograms, it was three times more massive than the largest living kangaroo. The biggest animal living in Sahul when humans arrived, and the largest marsupial species to ever live, was the Diprotodon. This hippopotamus-sized herbivore weighed up to 2,800 kilograms, inhabited most of Australia, and lived in herds of females that migrated seasonally to find water. The Diprotodon is sometimes called the giant wombat, due to the close evolutionary relationship to its much smaller cousin, and its two rodent-like large incisor teeth. Another key element of the Sahulian megafauna was a flightless bird, sometimes called the thunderbird. Thunderbirds were not closely related to ostriches or emus, and looked like an oversized goose with a large beak. It stood two meters tall and weighed 500 kilograms, twice as massive as an ostrich. Much like the megafauna on other continents, 
a large percentage of the species are now extinct, including all larger than 70 kilograms. And some of these animals went extinct after the arrival of humans, which leads to one of the most intriguing questions in global prehistory. What role did our species play in the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna? When it comes to Sahul, the scientific community is fractured into those who believe human hunting was the primary cause of megafaunal extinction, and those who believe humans played little to no role, assigning the blame instead to climate change, specifically a trend toward aridification. This debate remains contentious due to gaps of information in the fossil record and different interpretations of climate records. But there are some facts which are accepted by most experts. For example, around 24 species of megafauna, including the diprotodon, the thunderbird, and the giant short-faced kangaroo, all went extinct between 55,000 and 35,000 years ago. Importantly, those extinction dates fall after the arrival of humans. A comprehensive analysis of the fossil record in 2016 concluded that the estimated extinction dates for several species seems to cluster around 42,000 years ago. More recent studies support this conclusion. For example, microscopic analyses of some lake and marine sediments can quantify the number of spores of a particular type of fungus, which only grows in the dung of large animals. This dung fungus apparently became much less common in both North and South Australia around 42,000 years ago. Those who prefer the theory of climate change caused extinctions point out that in addition to the 24 species that went extinct after human arrival, at least 30 more large animals lived in Sahul over the past 400,000 years. They argue that those other species went extinct earlier, and that the loss of megafauna around 42,000 years ago may have simply been one of many naturally occurring episodes within a long-term trend toward the disappearance of megafauna. One problem with this is that many of those other megafauna species are only known from a small number of fossils, and the chronology of their extinction is difficult to reconstruct. If we set that issue aside and focus on the species for which we have the most information, those that survived to meet humans, the current evidence shows that many of them went extinct around 10,000 years after the arrival of humans in Sahul. This timeline suggests that if these extinctions were caused by hunting, the impact of the first hunter-gatherers was not immediate or drastic, but took effect over thousands of years. One weakness of this theory is the lack of direct archaeological evidence for human hunting of megafauna. Recently, a diprotodon bone was found among the debris of a camp dated to about 47,000 years ago in southeastern Australia, but this is the only clear case of megafauna bones alongside human tools. Megafauna hunting is much more well documented in the archaeological record of Eurasia, North America, and Africa. Those who advocate for human-caused extinctions argue that the scarcity of evidence for large game hunting is simply the result of the overall scarcity of archaeological sites, of which only 20 are dated to the period of overlap between humans and megafauna, and only some of those have preserved bones from hunted animals, usually smaller marsupials. In Sahul, the only species for which there is substantial evidence of predation is the flightless thunderbird. At dozens of locations across the more arid regions of Australia, hundreds of fragments of charred eggshells belonging to this bird have been discovered. The burning of these shells is believed to be caused by cooking. 
The oldest charred Thunderbird eggs are 54,000 years old, which is believed to mark the arrival of humans. The youngest charred eggs are about 47,000 years old, believed to represent the approximate extinction date of Thunderbirds. For around 7,000 years after arriving in Sahul, the earliest human inhabitants searched out the nests of these giant birds, collected their eggs, and cooked them over fires. This practice had a dramatic impact, one from which Thunderbirds were apparently unable to recover. The lack of evidence for human predation of megafauna led some experts to propose that climate change, specifically a trend toward less precipitation and less available fresh water, could have reduced the available habitat and plant food needed by large herbivores. Support for this theory comes from the beds of ancient lakes and rivers in eastern Australia that show evidence of drying between 48,000 and 42,000 years ago. Around the same time, the vegetation of Sahul was changing, including a decline of rainforest in northeast Australia, a decline of C4 grasses further south, and an increase in charcoal deposits from wildfires in certain parts of Australia. However, what complicates this theory of extinction caused by aridity is that other climate records do not indicate a drastic change in precipitation between 60,000 and 30,000 years ago. Also, most of these megafauna species had lived in Sahul for hundreds of thousands of years, during which they had survived many glacial cycles, including other severe bouts of aridity and ecological change. Also, the increase in wildfire in Australia around 42,000 years ago was modest, and might not have been caused by climate change, but instead by human activity, either due to intentional burning or as a knock-on effect of the decline in megafauna. It is difficult to untangle the interacting factors of fire, precipitation, vegetation, megafauna, and human hunters, based on the information we have. Some experts now prefer to invoke a combination of hunting pressure and aridification to explain the extinctions around 42,000 years ago. Whatever the ultimate cause, the disappearance of Sahulian megafauna followed a much different pattern to what we see in Europe, where the largest animals survived longer, and the extinctions were more spaced out. Hyena died out in Europe around 30,000 years ago, followed soon after by cave bear during the last glacial maximum, and others during the warming of the bowling alarod and Holocene. If human hunting in Europe caused the decline of species like cave lions and woolly rhinoceros, it took tens of thousands of years before it led to full eradication. However, climate change clearly played a key role in at least some of those Eurasian extinctions. So why did the Sahulian megafauna not last as long? One explanation is that large Eurasian animals had already been exposed to Neanderthal and Denisovan hunters for hundreds of thousands of years before the arrival of Homo sapiens. Over this period, they may have evolved strategies to survive in the presence of hominin hunters. On the other hand, Sahulian herbivores had little experience with human methods of hunting, and may have been more vulnerable. If this is the case, the arrival of our species in Sahul is one of the oldest examples of a radical transformation of continental ecology by human activity. The loss of herds of massive diprotodon, thunderbirds, and kangaroos would have had a cascade of ecological impacts, especially on the plants they ate and the carnivores that ate them. Armed with simple technology, and operating in small bands of hunter-gatherers, Homo sapiens may have reshaped the ecosystems into which they had dispersed, much like modern-day invasive species.
In our next episode, we will start examining the life, tools, and ornaments of the earliest inhabitants of Sahul. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support will allow me to continue bringing you our prehistory.